Hi, and welcome to Get to Know Your County Commissioner, the program that speaks to our elected officials about issues of importance to our community. I'm Erica Benitez-Gill. Today, I'm pleased to welcome District 12 Commissioner Jose Pepe Diaz to talk about legislation he sponsored that was recently passed by the County Commission. There are two measures that aimed at saving lives, both of people and animals. Welcome, Commissioner. Thank you for allowing me to be here with you, Erica. It's always a pleasure. Great. Let's talk about this no-kill policy. What does this mean for Miami-Dade County? Erica, this is the first initial step and looking forward to trying to save 90% of the animals that go into animal services. Um, this policy that we're looking for in the study that we're moving forward on is to basically analyze no-kill. There are several shelters uh, across the country, not too many, but a couple of them. And what we're trying to do is take in all the information from these shelters and try to find out the financial side of this as we move forward in creating our new shelter um, to try to build it looking forward to try to make this a no-kill shelter. These 180, 180 days financially will give us um, the study that we need and to allow us to have a better understanding as we move forward. So this is the first step among several other steps, but it is one that we have a commitment to try to make Day County a no-kill uh, animal service place. What are some of the programs the county needs to implement in order to have this no-kill in well, place? Well, right off the top, we, the idea is to try to save 90% 90, 90 of the animals that make it to us. But the most important part is education, um, you know, the comprehensive adoption program that we have, uh, volunteer programs, um, spay, neutering services. These are things that are, that are synonymous with no-kill and to have a, a better, more understanding type shelter and more responsive to our community, to our animals, to our people. Um, education is extremely important, Erica. Uh, try to educate people that spay and neutering is, is a must. Um, trying to give services that are affordable to everybody that uh, they could bring in their animals to be able to do this. Um, it's very, very important. Uh, and also at the same time, going back to the education component, teaching our children and, and the adults that be responsible, responsible pet owners. Um, if what, you, what does it mean to be a responsible pet owner? Well, one of the key things is uh, if you live in a house and, and or you live in an apartment, and in that apartment, you know, you, you, you really can't have a 200 pound dog, mm -hmm. per se. Um, you could, but it's not gonna be the, 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 the right place for it. Now, if you have a house that has a yard, the dog, you know, and, and, and so on. What happens is that in our, in our situation of life right now that we're living with the economic meltdown that we have gone through, a lot of people that had houses have had to readopt to different living facilities due to the economics and the job loss and so on. And we found that a lot of animals are being abandoned due to things like this. So responsibility when you own an animal is, is very important, having to deal with that animal. And not just because it looks cute as a puppy, let's, oh, it looks a cute puppy, let's just go ahead and adopt it. And No, that puppy grows into a full adult dog. Is that the way you vision yourself with that animal and the responsibility that comes to taking care of it, to spay, neuter this animal, making sure that that becomes your family member. That's actually That's, an excellent point. It, yeah. And it goes a lot with actually maybe doing research prior to adopting or, or getting a pet and bringing it into your home to make sure that it fits your needs almost. Absolutely, and, and, and that's what's key. Uh, I personally have uh, five multi, uh, four Maltesers in my house. Um, and basically I would tell you that they're part of our family and, and, and so on. And, they're part of our family, and we love our dogs, and that's the maximum you could have. You could have uh, four uh, per per house, um, but there's situations that we're looking at and my colleagues are looking at to, to bring forward where if you have a bigger yard and a, and a bigger acreage, maybe we could extend that amount uh, further and, and be able to, to help those that do rescues and, and so on, and to be able to, to be more, more deliberate as to being more protective of our animals. I believe Animal Services is um, receiving approximately 37,000 pets annually, um, which are either stray or abandoned pets. 
these numbers are extremely high. And how, how do you think we can lower those numbers? Well, again, going back to education, to adoption, to spade and neutering, Spayed and neutering is a big factor as we move forward into the future. People believe that the animal should not be spayed and neutering because the way they believe um, the animal should be able to reproduce and stuff, but at the same time reproduce. And what happens with those animals, um, cat population, uh, especially, and of course the, the dog population. And, and the people that I've met with, the different groups, which are so many, and I'm very proud of these groups that are out there, they, they really are dedicated people to try to to save and, and work with these animals um, really have taught me a lot as to the importance of spayed and neutering, to the importance of the animal care, um, and, and of course, uh, dealing with animals in themselves and, and their needs. Like mm -hmm. you said, you have to be responsible and you have to plan for the future uh, because it's a cute little dog, but that cute little dog could turn into a very big dog, or not so, but it needs to fit your family and your profile and what you do. As a resident, if I want to help animal services in either way, how, how can that be done? There's many ways. Um, volunteering. Uh, not everybody has the time to be able to volunteer. and Not everybody has a compassion and, and the ability to do so. So donating, I know that, that animal services got a wish list. And they could go on the internet and see that wish list and, and help out financially, uh, bringing the the, the material that is on that wish list, whatever they do. But uh, most of the people get so much satisfaction out of being able to volunteer and help out. But that's part of it. And then, of course, as, as commissioners, I love to hear from the people and, you know, to, to contact us here by internet or they call my office number or send us an emails. And they give us great ideas and great suggestions. And, and it's actually really been productive as we move forward and try to create these different uh, ideas into laws and into actual procedures within our animal services. Speaking of laws, the same day that um, this particular item passed, there was also an item requiring businesses to, um, with you know, to install parking lot barriers. How did this come about? Well, but before we go there, and I, I'm sorry to to, but there was a key point that it was also part of something that started which is the, the people that also take animals and abuse of animals. Mm. And they get the animals and they use them for fighting purposes and to, to be able to use them in a very, very ugly way. We are gonna also create very strict penalties, very strict laws, so we could eradicate that from our community. And, and I wanna be, and I'm sorry I interrupted, but I think it's important people understand that we're gonna take this very seriously and it's something that when you see these animals that are used and mangled and they're released and, and just left out there, um, it, it's, it's, very, it's very sad that that takes place in our society today. But it's also very sad the burden that it puts onto animal services and to have to deal with those animals afterwards. It's so I wanted to state that before we moved off it's that It's got to be disheartening to see because a lot of these animals may have very little chances of being adopted. If Absolutely. Anything. And those are the animals that you see euthanized more, 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 and, and we're unfortunately seeing more of that in our society, right. and that's something that we're going to work with our police department, with animal services, and with all the other entities that we need to work with to, to eradicate that as much as possible. Excellent. So let me, let me ask you now about the, um, the parking lot barriers. How did this come about? Well, this came about um, really by, by a father coming to see me, and uh, Mr. Juan and Carlos Abuelo, he, he came very passionate due to the loss of his daughter and her friend that were sitting in front of an establishment, beauty salon if I'm not mistaken, and uh, a car lost control and went through and killed them both. Um, there was no barriers, no nothing, the car would drive up right to the sidewalk of the establishment. We started to research and we started to go more into this and we found out that that this is really very apparent within the business community um, to be able to have just the cars drive up to the entrance uh, of these uh, shopping centers. So what we came up with is the new law that any new shopping center that will be created into the future or any shopping center that's gonna be remodeled to more than 40% of the shopping center 
has to now go about and create barriers, level three barriers, um, that will be done in an architectural way where these barriers themselves will hold a car from penetrating into these establishments. Um, we see this more and more in, in our community. Every time you turn on the news, you see this car penetrated the shopping center, this business, this, this establishment. And I think this is something uh, we look forward uh, to really changing, something that we can bring back the lives of the people that have been lost, but we can prevent the future life loss. And I think that's what's so important. And one of the key things is that a lot of people called and said, well, now I have to pay more money to have my shopping center have these um, barriers put up and, and so on. I would tell that to the people that have these shopping centers that I know things are hard and business is not the way it, it was and hopefully it'll get better. But there's no price on, on life um, and, and the circumstance that it could happen on it could happen a person that has a medical condition or simply just it's an accident mm -hmm. and it could take place. So I would say to those people, look, if you could put a barrier which is less expensive but could hold and be still visible to in a good way to that shopping center, try to do it. Um, we cannot force those that, that have these shopping centers to go back and do them now. But I think common sense and, and, and good stewardship will, will allow some of these people to put these barriers up. But it, and, and those people, and I'm glad we're talking about this, because I've gotten calls from people very nervous, do they have to do this? And it's only the ones that are the new shopping centers moving in the future and those that are re, redoing these shopping centers, these establishments where cars drive up to the entrance. What is the biggest concern of business owners when it comes to the parking barriers? The biggest concern is the actual cost and, and the, the space that it would take. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we've talked to not only our department that handles uh, uh, all building and zoning and so on, and they've really been very, very forthcoming on different things that could possibly be done. But also with people and entities that I've had the discussion with, there's, there's so many different types of barriers that could be done from poles uh, to poles with uh, certain kind of cabling on it to actually planters that are put in place that are very well uh, placed in into the ground where it becomes a very strong barrier. And, and it becomes a very aesthetically nice, you know, pleasant, aesthetically pleasant right. uh, situation. Unfortunately, some of these designs that have been taken in the past were taken very extreme, mm -hmm. literally to the door, right to the sidewalk of that establishment. So I, I think it's something that, um, at least moving forward, I think we've, we've done the right thing. This definitely came about from a very unfortunate tragedy and it was a very sad case. And one father's commitment to do the right thing and not let his, his, uh, his daughter and her friend's life go in vain without being able to, to do something about it. So as a father myself, it's, and as a human being, I think it's something that these are the kind of things that we need to do to, to rectify and to improve the quality of life for all of us in Miami-Dade County. Thank you, Commissioner. Definitely very important items. It is. I think these are, these are things that uh, are important to our community, important to our constituents, and especially when you see other parts looking at these items and saying, maybe we need this in our community, it's, it shows that we're doing the right thing. Thank you so, so much for being thank here. Thank you, Erica. Thank you. And that's all the time we have for this edition of Get to Know Your County Commissioner. I'd like to thank Commissioner Jose Pepe Diaz from District 12 for joining us. To obtain more information about this topic or any other county service, call 311 or visit MiamiDay.gov. I'm Erica Benitez-Gill. Thanks for watching.